our ethos and our brand is to serve our clients well. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I am your host, Ryan Willard. And in today's episode, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Holly Ferreres and David Horning of JHL Design. This wonderful design firm has long been a woman-owned and led company. It was founded in 99 by Jane Ferreres, Holly's mother. In 2003, Holly took the helm as president and today leads a 12-person team of collaborative dynamic design visionaries. And Holly and her husband, David Horning, ran separate businesses, collaborating on a number of projects. And then they came together in 2020 and officially combined forces, allowing for a much more streamlined and comprehensive approach to delivering their project. So David has decades of experience creating hospitality, retail and high-end single family residences. And he leads the building and architectural design side of JHL. The firm features an in-house multidisciplinary team that includes interior designers, architects, and procurement managers and specialists. And having architects on staff allows JHL to have a deep understanding of how buildings, mechanical systems, and interior spaces unify into a cohesive and artful space. JHL focuses on collaborating with highly skilled builders, craftsmen, fabricators, and artisans who are in close proximity to their projects and who have a fantastic working knowledge with materials. So this was a really great conversation with both Holly and David uh, around the kind of entrepreneurial success of their firm. And some of the topics that we discuss include things like having multiple streams of revenue from alternative service offerings from their interiors department, their architecture services, and also their furniture procurement, and how each of those actually ends up becoming almost like a business development um, arm for the other services in and of themselves. Um we talk a lot about the importance of tracking and knowing your numbers and David and Holly speak very openly about their work with work uh, with a business consultant and how they've managed to get that part of the business really locked down and the impact that it has had on them developing and creating and protecting profit. And we also talk about the um, second generation aspect of the company, obviously with Holly being the second CEO or second leader of the company, it being founded by her mother. And we talk about the challenges and the benefits of inheriting and growing and evolving a business like that. So sit back, relax and enjoy Holly and David. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. David and Holly, welcome to the Business of Architecture. What an absolute pleasure to be speaking with you. How are you? Oh, great. Thank you for having us. Doing very well. Thanks for having us. Excellent. So you are the principals at JHL. You've got a very fascinating business with kind of a lot of specialism within the world of residential and a very interesting kind of business structure where you're kind of integrating interiors, architecture, um, as well as furniture procurement. Um, and you guys have got an absolutely stunning portfolio of very um, elegant looking homes on your, <clears throat> on your website. Um, and I understand actually that the, the business was founded in 99 mm -hmm. by whose mother was it? Mine, Jane. It was your, it was your mother. Mm -hmm. So would you like to tell us a little bit about that and, and, and how you guys kind of came to take the rain, if you like, the reins. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my mom is very much an entrepreneur by heart. She's um, started many businesses along the way in her life, uh, but she fell in love with interiors after remodeling a historic home for our family. I was actually still in high school and right. um, it was quite an undertaking. So she took me along on the journey um, as a youth and I learned an incredible amount about renovation and historic renovation, um, and particularly the construction aspect of how things kind of fit together as you're living in a home that's under construction. And um, she was always 
decorating and, and redecorating the home. So this was just a deeper dive into that. And when I graduated from university, I traveled for about eight years um, and then ended up coming back to Oregon where the business was in my family. And um, I started working with her. I was really fascinated with the corporate um, design that she was working on. So helping brands develop new construction and kind of how their brand fit into the interiors of their spaces. Mm-hmm. And she invited me into the business and I thought, well, let's try it. Can't be, can't be too bad. And I fell in love with it. And 20 years later, we're still doing it. So Amazing. And David, and w- when was your entry into the business? My entry in the business has been actually quite recently. So it's been maybe five years where I've officially become part of JHL. Mm-hmm. Um, prior to that, um, I had my own architecture firm. Started that in 92, and we met actually working on a project together in 2007. So we've been working together for about 15 or 16 mm-hmm. years. Mm-hmm. Amazing. So so it's always interesting um would you consider the business then like you you are the second generation of leadership if you like your mother being the first absolutely um <clears throat> yeah we were just in los angeles this week speaking at the spring market panel at the civic design center um and my mom actually joined me there which was really fun to be able to honor her in a room full of people as the founder of our business um and although she stepped away you know 18 20 years ago she's still a a mentor of um, leadership in so many ways for me. And she um, has just been a foundation for the grassroots part of our business. We have a lot of clients here in Oregon that are repeat clients or that are generational clients. And some of our clients have been with us since, um, since before my mother retired. So. Oh, wow. Amazing. It's a big part of our, big part of our revenue. So, so that's often quite an interesting uh, kind of milestone in a business is is the the second generation succession if you like and the next steps of leadership and particularly when it's in a family business and i've had the the privilege of speaking with quite a few family run architecture Mm. design practices and sometimes it can be an outstanding success other times there's often tensions and i've I've spoken to people you know a, a parent and a child who have worked together and then they've gone their own separate de- de- um, mm. directions. What were some of the things that you had to navigate with, with your own succession and how did you make it your own? How, what was the sort of mm. plan that you had in mind to, to kind of put your own stamp on it, if you like? Right. Um, it's a great question. We have another family business that is four generations, so we're not... Oh, wow. So you're, um, you're seasoned veterans at this yes. game then. We could see a lot of the things that go wrong. I think um, I the way that it transitioned between my mother and myself was so direct. She retired completely, so she just was a, my phone a friend if I needed some help with a contractor. I had a sticky situation with a client. Um, she has everyone has their own unique style. I mean, there is no two people that would carry the baton the same way, but, um, I really, it was a pretty clean transition. She was excited to retire and then she ended up starting another business a few years later, but to get out of interiors and, um, running that business was definitely fine for her. There was no, there was no sticky point, but the style of, and the direction that I took the business was, um, kind of a little bit of a slow transition. It was around the time that David and I started working together. Um, he hired JHL for a uh, 20,000 square foot LEED certified building. And this was in 2006. So LEED certification was still a little bit of a new thing. Um, and it was a beautiful building. At the time, it was um, a $700 a square foot project, which was significant. Um, and it was very high end. There was a high touch, very um, bespoke materials. Uh, of course, they had to be lead certified. A lot of them were, were being made locally. Um, so at that point, it was a real transition to this high end, high level um, interior finishes where Jane's business model was really de- like a development business model. So she was working with corporate um, investors that were doing a little bit faster paced projects. They weren't as high end. Um, very lucrative and fun to work with business partnerships Mm -hmm. and to help them grow their development business and and construction business. But this was, this project in particular had a day spa, a corporate office and a really beautiful restaurant on the rooftop. 
And it was that juxtaposition between the residential and a commercial project because of the high level of finishes. Um, and after that, things started to really slow down in the commercial world, just with the economy. So we really used that as a portfolio piece to pivot into some residential work. Um, and it oh, began that's, so that's interesting. So actually, the actual kind of sector that you were focused on actually mm -hmm. shifted quite significantly. And then that kind of marked as well the beginning of a, a collaborative working relationship with yourself and, and David. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he definitely, I learned a lot from he'd done a lot of residential work. So he had a different platform for specifying finishes and had, putting schedules together, kind of some of the nitty gritty, not as sexy behind the scenes things. Um, so <laughs> he taught me, I think he taught me a lot about how to, to transition the two to get yeah. the amount of detail into our drawings and the projects. And really integrating, you know, the architecture in with the interiors. That's mm -hmm. something that I think we do really well. And it's a lot of times it gets overlooked in interior design firms. It becomes more about, you know, textures and finishes and not so much as of the whole. So we do a we do a really good job and really try to focus on doing the whole package. And that's um, where we bring in and we integrate the architecture, the interior and the furniture. And it makes a huge difference when we're mm -hmm. done with the project and really see the cohesiveness. So, so David, tell me a little bit about how you came to. So, you, were you working for your in your own business when you first started to collaborate, and then I you, was. You, yeah. You, you, how, how did how did the merger or how did the relationship begin to evolve? Um, it, it it well, it took some time. You know, I had had my own business for you know twenty years, and right. it, it was kind of a, a tough thing to you know we were in we also started a relationship so it was a tough thing to blend a relationship a personal relationship with work and is that something that's going to work for us so we really stayed independent for a long time mm -hmm. um, I definitely tend to be you know really on the creative side and not as much on the business side mm -hmm. and Holly does a little bit of both but she really excels on the business side and so blending my kind of lack of business with hers I think was she never really said this, but I kind of took it as maybe that wasn't the best um, blend and I should just kind of keep my mess over here. And so finally, after working together for a lot of years, we didn't work on every project together. I still did my own projects. But when we did, you know, the projects really, you know, they were really beautiful. Um, and after, you know, that time and working together, we finally realized, well, you know, this this does work. And we've worked together a lot. We can blend um, you know, a relationship and work. And so when we're at work, it's, it's really all about work. <laughs> and when we're home, you know, it's, it's, it's different. So we, uh, it's a real good, it's a real good partnership. Yeah. Well, well, this is another interesting question as well, when, you know, being romantically involved with each other and being in a, in a relationship, um, this can, you know, bring a, a, a wonderful level of depth and richness to a relationship, but also like this, that, that's, that's got to have, its own challenges as well. What, what, how, how do you manage to keep sane, if you like? How do you know when to talk to each other like business partners and when to talk to each other like, you know, in, in a relationship, husband-wife type it's of relationship? Really, I mean, I, we get this question so often, how, you know, or people say I could never work with my spouse. Um, I, David and I are very, we, he's right, we're really, we have different aptitudes and different skill sets, um, which I think is helps because we stay a little bit in our own corner um, and know what, what we're good at and really respect that at the workplace. Um, we talk a lot about work at home, I'm not going to lie, but it's usually when there's an issue, like we're working through maybe a client that does not syncing up with our business. They're, they don't align with our values. We try, I mean, the struggle of like how to handle a sticky client um, would be like an evening conversation that we maybe get us both worked up because we'll approach that very differently. Um, and so it's actually a good signal because we know each other so well when things maybe aren't syncing up at work or there's something, an employee the issue or something that we have to work through. It usually comes up after hours because we're not talking about it at the office. Um, but David's, a, you know, he, he's got a, such a strong creative eye. He spends so much time entering our staff. So I appreciate that as I'm out meeting new clients or, or writing contracts or uh, speaking in LA this week. So he really has a very good handle on our entire creative process and our team, um, which is absolutely foundational. When our business, when we joined forces, it was really out of necessity 
to provide one easy path for our clients. Mm -hmm. More and more, we were getting clients that wanted to build a custom home and do the interiors, which was fantastic. And we shared an office, so we would be in the same space, but they would get two separate contracts. They would see two different logos on the door. Right, so you're kind of repeating work. What is this? And why are we transitioning from this person invoicing to this? So it was really a way to service our clients in the best way. Um, And that was, we did have to have a real talk about now that you're under the JHL umbrella, like the benefits are great and, you know, all the contracts are written for you, but, you know, here's your role. And a mentorship role was a really important um, Mm. part of David's aspect. And he's, he'd been working, you know, basically he had a, a small staff and a partner, but they produced a high volume of work with a very few, few people on their team. Um, and that wasn't the way that we're structured. So, uh, he was a little bit like, oh, I don't want, I just want to do my work and sit in the corner. <laughs> well, it's time to, uh, to pass the baton. We're at the phase in mm. our career where training people can be really satisfying. And, um, it's been, it's been fun to watch him do that, but yeah, it's-, yeah, it's been good. It's been good. We do. We also set time, um, a, a way for us to um, focus on our relationship and work. So mm-hmm. today's Friday. So we have Friday night, date night, and it's like almost, it's pretty religious for us. It's pretty much every Friday. Nice. We go out and spend time together. And then we try not to talk about work at those. Yeah. And we have um, a Thursday morning business meeting. So we're, we really, cause sometimes the important issues, we just don't, you know, like where you sit down and focus on business. Just it's not going to happen at home. We don't have time when we're in the office, so we set a time and we spend two to three hours every week just working through business issues. Yeah. So, um, w- when you were kind of merging together, if you like, was was there a, a a moment where you sat down and kind of designed the roles for each other and kind of looked at what what kind of skill sets you both had and and kind of said like Holly, you're going to be involved in more business development and and David, you'll be more involved in the kind of operations and mentorship. Um, was it an active conversation or did you kind of have a good instinctive feel for where your skill sets lay? And and what did the partnership actually allow you to kind of specialize in, if you like? Same was, question, phrase yeah, different way there. Great questions. We, we did. We, um, we've been very intentional about how to grow the business, even though it, it's a, I mean, architecture and interiors can be a lifestyle business in mm. a lot of ways, meaning supporting, you know, our family and our, our, our professional desires, but we really have a, I think both of us have a very strong desire to mentor and grow the business. So it doesn't just have something that's supporting us, that it's supporting our community, that it's supporting our staff. Mm-hmm. So the business approach that we've taken, I think gives us a really unique leg up for a firm that's our size. We have um, 13 people on staff, right now we had about 17 last year at the kind of the peak of the COVID project load. Um, and with that size business, it was very obvious when we grew past maybe 10 that we had to have core values. We had to have a, you know, a responsibility, um, an org chart. Uh, so people knew who their managers were, the people that were checking in on them, um, how to grow professionally. We have so much training that we do. So, um, it was important for, I sort of dipped my toe in the water first and let David work on the creative side. So that all of that work takes so much time and effort. It's really, I mean, this podcast is the business of architecture. So it is still a business. Although we do design beautiful buildings and creative interiors, um, the business has to be a good foundation in order to be successful for decades. So um, when we started growing, we hired a consultant and really worked on our business model and our our strategy, who, who was our ideal client? How was our business structured? Um, how do we take care of our employees in a way where they can shine and provide the most amazing client service? So I stepped a, I would say a fraction of my time was out of the business. This was in 2021. And I really dug in deep and said, we have to have the foundation in order to do the kind of work we want. And because we have to support our team and be able to talk about it. So um, and then David came in um, and kind of reintegrated into what what we had been working on the, our leadership team, and it was a really good move because, you know, I thought, well, he can just do the creative, but it, if you're going to be that integrated into the team, it's important that everyone can see the vision and the direction. Um, so we work pretty heavily on that now, and 
I think he kind of likes that side <laughs> too. So. Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very um, excited to hear that you've got things like, uh, you know, an, an org chart and a vision framework and mission and com- company values and that you work with the consultant. Um, and, you know, that's, that's something actually, that's a leap that lots of practices at design firms never actually take. And in the long term, it can be really detrimental, no matter how good of designers you are. If the business pieces are not in place, then we end up seeing, you know, a, a, a quick stagnation, if you like, or the, or the talent can never get released or fully realized. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it's, it's, been a game, it's been a game changer for the business, really. It's, it's, uh, it's been interesting for me to see, looking at it from the perspective of having a business for many years that didn't have any of that. It was really, you know, a bunch of creative guys just doing some stuff and, you know, just writing contracts and scrambling. And, and there was always a lot of work and sometimes there wasn't, but then the next job came and you just kept going. And now we have a real purpose and a vision and um, it's super exciting. And it's it's really, we've got all this, um, these programs that, you know, we can just check our business profitability. We just push a button and say, you know, like, wow, and, you know, this is, we're doing great. You know, and sometimes you think, well, it's not so good. And we go to the, go to the computer program and boom. Um, it's, and that's really exciting to have that data and that information, mm-hmm. um, which before it was like, well, I think we're doing pretty good. And now we mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. And, and also with all the leadership things that come in and working with our staff. And I really have enjoyed the mentorship part of that. It's been it's been fun teaching, you know, other people in the in the office the things that I know you take it for granted when you've done it mm-hmm. for so long. And so it's been um, fun to, to share that with some of the staff. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so th- th- there's a number of different services then that, that happen in the business. We've got the interior side, we've got the architecture side, and then we've got the furniture procurement. Do, do you find then that you might get commission for an interior project and then that naturally leads to architectural services and vice versa and that even actually furniture procurement is is, is that an, is that a kind of upset at the end of the process or can that actually lead to to more involved design services itself we've had it every single way and right. i i um i was asked recently like what would you give what would your advice be to, to a younger like, professional in your, um, in interiors. And I said, always take a meeting. Um, because I've had the most obscure phone calls. I had a phone call about three years ago that someone asked if, they, if I did home gyms and I said, home gyms, <laughs> like, I, I think I might, um, who's asking and what, what are the needs? And they said, well, just come, come visit us at our home. And I said, okay. So, I went to um, a beautiful residence in the West Hills of Portland and they wanted to move a wall. The husband had a very small, it was like a basically a larger closet, but as an exercise room, they wanted to move it about two feet because they wanted a new piece of equipment. And I said, well, yeah, we, we can do that. But we walked around in the lower level of their home and it was a beautiful colonial. And I said, what happens down here? What there's a guest room and there's a lounge and this is how you access through the garage. And, um, the husband and wife were meeting with me. They said, well, we have a teenage son. He's, you know, in eighth grade. And I said, where, where does he spend time? And they said, well, in his room. And I said, well, <laughs> we have four kids together. I said, if he's going to want a space to hang out with his friends. This is the prime. Let's make this the coolest lounge teenage hangout. And they said, oh, no, I have this vision for this gym. And I said, okay. So we went away and I sketched, we sketched on some paper and I brought David back and I said, so David, we're going to move this wall. And we, we kind of pitched this together, but this, we, they said, we've been thinking about what you said and we think maybe we'll remodel the whole space. Well, this, the, um, the husband is a global CEO. He has 400, over 400,000 employees. He works in his home from this top floor. And I only give you perspective because the home is a sanctuary and it has to be, it's like a fortress of lockdown. So there's a lot of privacy issues. And he said, I just don't know if we can do a remodel. And I said, well, here's, I'm going to introduce you to our team and let's talk about it before you say no. So Mm -hmm. we ended up renovating the entire basement. David was really instrumental in helping um, with the design portion, but it was, we paneled the, the entire lounge in this beautiful mahogany sapili wood with these dividing walls and had like a reading lounge. And then there was the TV lounge. Um, the gym did not get touched at all. 
It got clapped, <laughs> beautiful wood with these louvered, these louvered doors. Um, and they were so thrilled with the end result. They said, now the rest of our house needs help. So we went basically from the, from the lower level all the way to the top floor um, and off to move a wall two feet for a home gym. So, and it, it, we slice that in many different ways. We've been asked to do furniture package. We don't really do furnishings for clients that aren't already integrated into our system. So either they're a, an extension of their renovation or their remodel. Um, but we have done those on um, larger projects, but hmm. we, we really, I mean, our, our ethos and our brand is to serve our clients well. And if we can do that and it's profitable for us, and it makes financial sense for them and they'll be happy with the end result and they're great people. We'd love, we'd, we'd love to do that. So um, our ideal project is the new construction, whether that be, we do some um, corporate work and some hospitality, retail, restaurant work, then integrate it into interiors. And then we, you know, do all the furnishings, hang the artwork on the wall, accessorize, and um, that really gives most, the most comprehensive mm. end result. And it's the most rewarding for our team. So we try to hit that ball, but sometimes it comes in different ways. And and it's, a, yeah. it's a very interesting story, actually, because it, it obviously demonstrates a kind of salesmanship or a, 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 at the very least a very a good ability to be able to listen beyond what a client is saying on the surface. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of times people – they live or work in their space and what they think they need is not really at all what they need. Mm -hmm. They need a solution because something's not quite right. They know that part, but they don't really know exactly what it is. Um, David, I think you should talk a little bit about Greenleaf. Um, our project that was a kind of a light touch remodel mm -hmm. that started in 2017. And they just moved in recently. And we have four, over a four year project. It started out as, um, it, was a, it was a large house that had been, it was a Tudor style house, which we do, you know, we really kind of lean more towards modern type architecture, but this was a, a renovation. And so it had a very traditional exterior, and kind of leaned a little bit towards more modern interiors, um, but still respecting the traditional nature of the house. And we ended up, it had been added on to a lot of times and it just had, it, it really had lost its character. So we spent a lot of time and effort to bring it back. Um, we added a new, it, it didn't have a, a front porch or it was, it was a very, it was a almost a 30,000 square foot house. And it just it ne didn't have any sense of entry. So we completely redid the hardscape and landscape in front. We added a porch, we added a walkway, we added a vestibule inside. Um, and it was a real, you know, transformation um, and kind of out of respect for the history of the home because it was built in the 20s. Um, so it was it was a real uh, rewarding project in that sense. And that project extended all the way through. Um, I think we touched gosh, three quarters of the house um, and it's extended all the way through the furnishings, interior design package. Um, and just really it was a beautiful showcase um, for our work. We were able to use yeah. a lot of um, really high-end finishes and light fixtures mm. and uh, yeah, it's stunning. You don't see any of it on our website yet because it's <laughs> going to be published and that's the game. So, <laughs> But we're a really wonderful project that ended up just, you know, a few rooms needed to be remodeled mm. to, you know, yeah, it's a 26 thousand square foot house. So we took it all the way down to the studs and I would say 90% of this the space. So, um, wow. you just kind of never know until you really get into the ethos of what people need and want and mm -hmm. what the project needs. I mean, that house had a lot of updating and, you know, during the, during the additions and remodels, there just wasn't good workmanship and the clients wanted a really quality home. And, and they didn't realize that at the time. So we went in and, you know, we look at it and we're like, what can we, and it was just, it was the kind of home you would not want to spend a lot of money on. Um, without really fixing it. It would just be putting, you know, you know, more kind of trash on top of trash. And so it yeah. was, it was, and so it turned into a bigger project than they really wanted to bite off, I think at the beginning. And then they got invested in it and they, they took a lot of pride in it. Um, but we redid, I mean, we did uh, beautiful crown moldings in the mm -hmm. dining rooms and we 
designed them, you know, and built them. They, these were crown moldings that you buy at, you know, just a crown molding. You, we built them and all the pieces of how it was traditionally mm-hmm. done. Um, and so it took a lot of time, a lot of effort. Um, but the end results in the dining room was paneled with beautiful paneling. And um, we've, I've done quite a bit of that work in the past, but it had been quite a few years. And so we went back and did a lot of um, research, you know, mm-hmm. to get that, because it's all about proportions when you're working with paneling and crown moldings. Mm-hmm. And um, so we spent a lot of time to get it right. And it really shows it in the end result. Mm-hmm. It was a fun project. I mean, that's something that's interesting about our firm is that um, we, like Holly mentioned before, we do a lot of work that is very client driven on what type of architecture they want. So we we have a style and if you look through our website, you see it, there is some cohesiveness, but it's kind of all over as far as there's a Tudor house, there's a modern beach home, there's a modern wine country house. Um, and then there's that the, uh, the house we did in the West Hills with this beautiful jewel box, you know, basement. So, um, but it's about making the clients happy. And it's really like, I don't, we very rarely, if they're, good, excited, passionate people that are passionate about design will turn down a project. It's, you're like, wow, you know, one, I, at one point I designed a Louisiana lowland style home. Uh-huh. <laughs> What's a Louisiana lowland style home? So we did some research and, you know, they were from the South and that's what they wanted. So we researched it and it was a beautiful home um, mm-hmm. yeah. and it was, it fit what they wanted. It made them happy. And so it's uh, once, I think only once, maybe twice, I've had a client come in and say, just design what you want to design for us. Yeah. And that was a, a beautiful home for mm-hmm. a repeat client as well. And it was a lot of fun for me. I mean, it was, here it is. And, you know, I presented it to them and they said, oh, we love it. And so that was a, that was a very rewarding part too. But we, we enjoy kind of all aspects of the design and working with the variety of clients. Mm-hmm. How, how do you perpetuate the work if you like or how do you communicate to a broader audience or keep the visibility of the practice you know amongst your network and you know keep keep attracting these high caliber uh, clients Mm -hmm. um that's a good question i we've so 20 24 years we've been in business um most of our business is word of mouth so it's repeat clients it's people's you know, now we're getting to the point where people are re- referring their children who are building their first home or, oh, wow. or want a vacation home or renovate a condo. Yeah. Um, contractors love working with our firm because our drawings um, and our team are very professional and our drawings are robust. They can build off of them and execute beautifully. They know exactly what the client wants when we turn over a set of drawings. Um, we don't advertise. I've been definitely marketing our business more in the past year, year and a half. Um, our a lot of our work is local, and Oregon's gone through such a um, a tough time with during. You know, we had basically every movement go through the city of Portland. You know, the Me Too movement, and um, we had so much rioting. So a lot of like executives have either decided to move or corporations have moved right. out of Oregon. Um, so it's an interesting time. I I'm fourth generation Oregonian mm-hmm. and, and David is about the same, I think. So I, we we're based here and locked here, but we definitely are working more outside of the state more than we have been, um, of, of recent past. So we have a couple projects going in central Oregon, which is a hotbed for, um, second homeowners, a lot of people are moving there from California. Um, Oregon Wine Country is, um, we've got a couple projects there, which is really exciting. It was just in the in Time Magazine for one of the best places, 20 places in the world, I think. Right. Which kind of, uh, you could a have, hotel. Yeah. Um, so we've done projects in Arizona. We're looking um, more and more outside the state. So I've been hitting the road. I mentioned I was in Los Angeles this week speaking at um, the spring market panel in at the design center and meeting with architects that are doing projects globally. Um, you know, some of them were doing projects that were over 400,000 square feet, which is maybe not the best fit for us. But I think just being out there more and meeting people to understand what the landscape is outside of our immediate community, which is where mm-hmm. we've been, um, 
we have, I have some great business resources. We work with some pretty large architecture firms here locally too, that where the principals and I can get together and really strategize what's happening in our, um, what projects are you going after? How can we get creative? Mm-hmm. We just this week, um, Oregon, not surprisingly, it's passed the first legalized psilocybin treatment center. Um, and we right. have to be working on one of the first. Um, it's not necessarily a huge budget project or, or glamorous, but as a um, barrier to entry for being an expert in that is significant. And we, mm-hmm. we designed one of the most, um, one of the first high-end cannabis stores in Oregon um, called Sarah. It's on our website. It's a beautiful project. We mm. uh, a branding firm here locally did the concepting and we had a relationship with the client because we were doing their residence and they asked us to help us execute that. And it was all these custom pieces. It was, it's basically like a high-end jewelry store when you walk in. So the experience of purchasing cannabis in a completely different way um, is a new, th- there's, there's a really creative way to get there. And I think yeah. that's JHL is really great at problem solving and understanding what the client's business objective is or introducing a new concept to them. Like not, let's just not be a mental health, you know, lounge where people take mushrooms. Let's actually create an experience that people that's repeatable, that people can, you know, take it nationwide or they they fly here because the experience is so beautiful and the, mm. the atmosphere is beautiful um and we can get people excited about that opportunity and i think we're great connectors so they might say like oh well we can't afford to do that you know we're just we're just a wellness clinic um yeah. we can find the right people to help them carry that vision through so that's a really exciting part um, so that, that, that's 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 very that's very fascinating actually kind of being involved in these emerging um industries and, and and sectors and kind of being almost like an early adopter in a way where where you're kind of helping those kinds of businesses and being at the start and it's a it's a good way to establish a you know an additional niche if needed right yeah it's it's i mean it's it, there is something as I was flying back to little Portland from Los Angeles, there's something about being in this size community and the, I mean, being here for four generations, the authenticity of people in this market and the opportunities here, partly because it's a smaller community, but, and people know each other well, but they're also, there's not that, that kind of competition, I think, from a LA or New York market where mm-hmm. business owners work together um, really closely and we advocate together and we, um, I think it's an exciting marketplace. There's just an opportunity to learn an immense amount. Amazing. Well, what has it been like in terms of hiring and building a team where you're at? I mean, I know in the US, there's in North America in general, there's just been it's been very very difficult to find architectural staff and design staff certainly of a kind of mid-tier career Mm -hmm. position um this this is becoming how how have you kind of navigated your way around you know hiring finding team members and just retaining talent can we pass on this? <laughs> this has been the hardest thing. I actually I'm very passionate about it, but I would say it has been the hardest thing. The COVID was really hard on that part of our business. Yeah. Um, until then, it was a breeze. Um, there's just been a lot of movement, so people physically moving in and out of Oregon. Um, we we hire local people. That's something that we have not deviated from. Not that we won't in the future, but for now and how we serve our clients and how we work together as a team that works with our business model. Uh, so that makes our, our pool of, um, of hiring a lot smaller. We do find that there are people moving here that have good talent. So we can train people. It takes about a year and a half to train people to do the design and work with our team the way we expect. And we invest a lot of time and money in getting that. So we, we really try to retain people. So there we get the value out of them being trained and yeah. they enjoy working here. So it's, it's been tough. Um, we're in that mid-level market of, you know, there is no real local firms that do what we do on the level that we do. There's people that provide architecture, interiors and furniture, but not for the that high end 
um, caliber that we have. So to find people that have this skill set and then fit our company culture is a huge challenge. It takes yeah. a very long time. So we, you know, we've been looking for certain positions for over two years mm -hmm. and just, you know, interviewing people on a regular basis and just not finding that right fit. Mm. Um, and it's, it's tough. And when we find them, we want to keep them. Um, and we do a lot at JHL. Again, it's part of that kind of business planning. Um, so there's a lot of support for staff. We have great benefits. Um, we, we do, do a lot of check-ins, team building events, check-ins. I mean, it's, it's a, it's very important to us. And mm -hmm. it's, a, again, it's part of that thing that, um, our business leadership team has, has helped develop is what, what can we do to keep our employees and that we talk about those things, you know, mm -hmm. which is, which is exciting that we're um, trying to be proactive and we want to have a really nice community at our workplace for us and for our employees. We're here to you know, help build their futures as well. It's mm -hmm. important to us. Um, and it's, 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 it makes it exciting and more rewarding for us at, in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, well, we, our culture is, I mean, we have our core values printed on the wall at the office and we, we remind, we have, um, two to three meetings a year up that are all staff meetings. They're a couple hours long and we go through all of our goals. We talk about our core values. And I say it every few, few times a year, we hire and fire off of our core values. So the culture wow, wow. of our company is, um, is so strong and it's, we're so committed to it. So that's trust, that's supporting each other. That's providing the most, the best client service. So if people don't align with that. It becomes pretty obvious. Um, and if they don't, it doesn't fit with how our services end up mm. being portrayed to our client. And that's what keeps people coming back. Well, just a kind of broader pre um, perspective, what do you think have been the reasons for the kind of challenge in finding, um, you know, that, that kind of mid-tier mm -hmm. career level? Where have, they, where have they all gone? Well, I think that that high-end residential project pool is so small, so people right. just they haven't had the experience. They might have the aesthetic and they understand the, the like desire of the look of the room, yeah. but they've never executed it before. So mm -hmm. we've pulled talent from larger commercial firms um, that we know they have, that we can see they have the eye and that they have, they can get in and they, they can come in and pitch, they can talk to clients, but they don't have the drafting skill. They don't understand how to put things together. Um, they can see it in a picture, but we have to teach them how to actually execute it. Right. So it's not, you know, they, I think the higher for the person you can, you can um, teach the skill set is what the, our mentality is. And it's, um, we don't need a lot of people to get things done. You know, our staff is probably not going to grow too much more, but um, we, yeah, and we, COVID was a big boom for businesses. You know, we thought it was going to be very detrimental, but it actually was a time where there was more design happening and we were, the busiest we've ever been. And that was not just with us. That was a lot of other firms. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the mid-size and bigger firms snapped up a lot of talent. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, well, I know that things now are changing in that realm. And so people are getting laid off and things are not quite as busy. And so there'll be more people looking for work, which will be helpful for us. Cause right. I mean, there's been times where there's just nobody, no one responds, nobody responds, you know, there's just not, yeah. not out there. Um, and so I think that's going to change a little bit. And, and also, that's, yeah, that's really for those senior positions yeah. that are, um, that we're, where we really need somebody to be able to run the art, you know, mm -hmm. we've director of our, our director of interiors. We've had that posted for a long time. And, you know, I've, the people that I'm interviewing are moving here from San Francisco, LA, bigger markets. Um, let's just talk a little bit about profit in the in the business and how do you manage profit in your own business in terms of you know either software tools and david you were mentioning there there's kind of project management tools that you've got that you that you kind of use um but also in the in the ways that you set fees and negotiate how do you mm -hmm. kind of think about profit or prioritize it or manage and protect it throughout the kind of life cycle of a project and just in general in the in the office mm -hmm. We have, David alluded to that as a computer program, we do have a really great tech platform that uh, we've invested in for two two of our 
business sides of our business. One is how do we charge and how do we calculate our profit? And then the other one is how do we order a source um, track and our procurement sites? It's a, the procurement is a significant part of our revenue stream too, um, knowing that we're installing a home that's 10, 10 to 20,000 square feet and they need furniture. Um, and we love providing that service for them. Um, but to, to handle that amount of furniture at once ordering requires a lot of sophisticated um, planning. And what we realized was that, that we have to be in a certain platform for technology for that. So we use Studio um, for our procurement software. It runs these amazing reports. We have clients that call, we had a client call, they had a break in and some of their product was their furniture was damaged and this was eight years ago and this program can allow us to look up every single trim every single fabric for window coverings um it's a great resource for that um but also to run reports and and tell clients what's arrived how what was the condition and when will it be installed so they always know they're not calling us to ask questions so we use studio we use another program called dell tech which is really geared for larger architecture firms. I don't know is if it, it's... It's a JIRA. Pardon? Is it a JIRA? Or... It's called Dell Tech. Oh, okay. Um, and it's 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 a PC-based program, so it's not very... The platform isn't <laughs> very sexy. It's it's a little bit clunky for... I'm, we have a hybrid office, so I'm still a Mac user, and the design team uses um, PCs. But it's... It's a such a robust system. I mean, it is like getting behind the a Lamborghini. Like you don't just jump in and start driving. You right. wouldn't know how to. You wouldn't know how. So it's great because when you learn how to use the tool, it's so sophisticated that we can get really granular on. You know, did we go over in schematic design? How was our DD? What's what are we trending towards for CA time for construction and administration? So we can tell clients it's going to be an average of X dollars. And then there's no surprises. There's no, oh, we have to, you know, we told them it was going to be three to five thousand and it's actually six to eight thousand a month. We can't charge them that because they're not going to. We've already told them the expectation, but this is the reality. So this program has been great for to look at our profitability in that way. Um, but it's also allowed us on the staffing side to do utilization and project staff time right. for the projects that we have in the pipeline. So we know we're not overloading people or we can see, gosh, we really need a junior architect because this is how we're going to build for this project and we need somebody to be training on it. So it's a great tool. It's also the main of my existence because <laughs> I feel a little bit tired. There's a couple of people that are really experts at running it. We've been using that platform for about a year and a half, but it takes a really long time to understand all the bells and whistles to it. So um, I'm ha I'm really happy with it. It's given us a leg up and it's what it has done is it's established this groundwork. So if we did need to grow, it's not a big, it's not a terribly big mountain to climb because mm -hmm. it, it can plug people in and we can um, just worry about the design work rather than, how to, you know, calculate staffing or, or profitability, but the reporting is, is amazing. And it really, it, it does, it. it's what helps keep, let us keep track of our profits. So, we, you know, we said that it helps us determine what to charge for future projects mm -hmm. too, because we have such a great record of what it takes. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what I was alluding to earlier is before it was like, oh, well, I think it's about this, but well, now we know, you know, really from history, how much a project's gonna cost so we can project for the future can figure out what profit we want to make. And then we can track using this program to make sure we're hitting those mm -hmm. numbers. Yeah. And it works really well. It's allowed us to do more projects fixed fee, which clients love. Yeah. Um, and we're confident that we're not losing money, <laughs> that we're able to make some money on it. So um, it's a win-win, I think, for both in that way. Amazing. Brilliant. I think that's a, a perfect place to begin to conclude the conversation what does the rest of 2023 have for you guys in store mm, we have some really exciting projects that we've been working on for several years that are um, getting completed and uh, we can't wait to photograph them um one is in oregon wine country it's a nine bedroom bed and breakfast that's um was concepted by jhl and we worked with a larger architect firm that was his architect of record on it and we did the interiors it's called in the ground and it's under ground um oh, wow. subterrain and it's yeah it's beautiful it sits up on a hill over in the overlooking wine country um 
And we've got a beautiful post and beam house in Central Oregon that's getting um, completed and we'll install the furniture in the spring. Um, and it's been a labor of love for our clients. It's, it's really a special project and one that we hadn't done before. It's, yeah, it's fun when we're do, we do these projects and they're long-term investments in our time and the client's time. And it, so when we have a year like this where there's three big ones, it's, it's pretty exciting they're going to be done because they're, these are three and four year mm-hmm. projects from design to the end. Mm-hmm. So it's good for our team too, because they get a, some of them haven't been part of a project, you know, that they started and then they get to see it to completion. So it's exciting for them as well. So. Mm-hmm. And we have a restaurant that's opening in April. So really soon that um, is in Southeast Portland. That is a restaurant group that has just been fabulous and made a big footprint in Portland. So everyone's excited to be able to have a, have a lunch there. Brilliant. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for giving us, well, sharing your expertise and your insights around how you've run your, run your business and showing us um, all the, the kind of inner workings and giving us a glimpse of the mechanisms at play of how you run a successful firm. So I really enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan. It's been a thank pleasure. Yeah, nice to talk with you. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.